let me just check is if everything is going fine so I think yes I think it is going fine so let me get ready also with the phone I am trying uh, innovative solutions for connecting and but unfortunately my network at home it becomes uh, worse and worse so I just want to tell you that if you have problems uh, if you notice that it's uh, unusually slow with respect to the to the other times uh, to the other lectures uh, please uh, let me know let me know because i can try to find a solution to speed it up okay good and uh, as usual if you have any any question write on the chat i am just trying okay i think in this way is fine i'm trying to combine the phone with the pc because it's useful for me okay very good so let me share my screen screen one perfect and in particular i would like to go to i would like to go to okay the web page here okay first of all i would like to go back and discuss again the final part of the last lecture because i was a bit hurried and i realized that i was not I was too fast so let me go first of all let me show you first of all what are the news that I introduced the news are that uh, I put some boxes there a first box uh, is describing probability probability it's just a reminder for you I think you already know very well what probability is but still I wanted to Put a reminder with the definition of probability and keep in mind that this may be asked at the exam there are the three axioms of kolmogorov in particular and also there is the definition of probability distribution and probability density so if you scroll down there is a very basic treatment and this is something that you see it's quite short and then I included an, another box to better specify some terminology in general I better specify the terminology and uh, in particular I put uh, the definition of, of um, the term which identifies the rear part of the ship which is the stern the rear part of the ship is called the stern and uh, when we talk about the wind of coming from astern means that it's coming and uh, hitting the sheet on the rear part the bow it's uh, the front part of the ship also i wanted to put this box defining what is the ballast the ballast is a kind of additional weight that can be loaded or unloaded by by storing and releasing water into a tank in the ship so when the ship stores more water it's increasing its ballast and the reason why it is increased is to increase stability and we say that a water is in ballast when it is empty of goods empty of passengers and it's only loading the ballast a ship in ballast is more exposed to winds because the water line is placed at a lower level if you look at the body of the ship we used these terms uh, in the last lecture i wanted to make them clear and uh, you see here i am now selecting a ship is said to be in ballast when it's carrying ballast only 
and as such the ship is more exposed to side winds okay and then we discussed this relationship for estimating the wind force i am now selecting it let me increase the font size okay and i just would like now to to make some considerations on this relationship to explain how it's derived and uh, this consideration will allow you to better understand some specification that you can read here for instance let me select this sentence we discussed it we said when designing berth structures a minimum wind velocity of 30 meter per second with a gust factor of 1.2 should be adopted and between parentheses you can read the minimum wind pressure in other words should be 0.81 kilonewton per square meter i just want to explain how this value 0.81 comes from relationship one which i am highlighting now i just want to make a couple of computation with you to explain this also i want to better explain this figure which results precisely from uh, equation one okay good so let me now uh, as i said better explain uh, equation one and uh, first of all you see that uh, we have uh, at the beginning of the right hand side cw CW is a wind force coefficient and uh, as I already anticipated it depends on the shape of the ship above water and the orientation of the ship to the wind direction so CW doesn't include any gust factor I want a, a better um, correct uh, uh, mistake that I did last time, I said the CW takes into account the gas factor. This is not true. So CW depends only on the shape of the ship. There is a microphone open if you can please close it. As I said, there is a microphone open. Can you please close it? Thank you. Can you please uh, close your, sh your microphone? Okay. Can you please close your microphone? Student, can you please close it? Okay, I'll do it. It seems that now it's closed, otherwise I, I can do that. I just never did, so I was. Okay, let me let me go back to my web page. As I said, CW depends uh, just on the shape of the ship and the orientation of wind. And you see some uh, rules of thumb here for wind crosswise to the ship, uh, CW is 1.3. If it is wind against the bow, uh, CW is 0.9. And for wind against the stern, CW is 0.8. Of course, uh, uh, crosswise wind, which means uh, wind uh, perpendicular to the ship center line, is the most dangerous. What is the ship center line? Let's go down in the web page just to explain to you. This is a revised figure that I, I modified uh, just yesterday. You see the ship center line it's uh, the horizontal dashed line and uh, also please pay attention uh, to the angle phi between the ship center line and the wind direction it's the acute angle i should put here um, a text wind direction because it's not clear i will do that okay and uh, let let me go back then to the relationship as I said, as I said, uh, now let's move forward with the explanation of uh, 
of the other coefficient. We have a w. I look here. A w is the side area of the ship above water projected over the ship longitudinal plane in square meters. Why do we introduce the areas here? Because we are computing the wind force. And in order to compute the wind force, we are multiplying the wind pressure, which uh, I will explain later how it is computed, times the exposed area of the ship to wind, times the windage area. And the windage area, it's projected over the ship longitudinal plane first, AW, okay? And then it will be also projected over the ship transversal plane, therefore obtaining BW, which is the next symbol. It's the BW, it's the front area of the ship above water projected over the ship transversal plane. So the two areas projected along the longitudinal and transversal direction. And then these areas are multiplied by sin square phi and cos square phi. Why is that? Because wind, uh, wind it's uh, not perpendicular to the ship not perpendicular to the center line, in general not aligned with the center line, it's uh, hitting the ship at an angle, and that angle is phi. So we need to find the wind component, which is orthogonal to AW and orthogonal to BW. And in order to get the wind component that is orthogonal to AW, we have to multiply by sin phi. This is simple, simple trigonometric function. And then you may wonder why sin square? Because we need to find the component of velocity that is perpendicular to AW, but the velocity is squared. If you look at the end of the right hand side, you see that the velocity is squared. And this is why the sin is squared as well. Then we make the same computation for BW to estimate the wind velocity component, which is perpendicular to the front area of the ship. And then we multiply velocity by cos square. And again, velocity squared, and therefore the cos is squared as well. Good. And then uh, we get uh, to the final part of the right hand side where we have the multiplication of gamma w, which is specific gravity of air. This is multiplied by the square of the wind velocity divided by 2g. This multiplication, this product, gamma w times uh, Vw square divided by 2g is giving us the wind pressure. And then the wind pressure, which is multiplied by the area of the ship that is exposed to the wind and multiplied by the coefficient Cw, gives us the wind force. So, what uh, we just said is uh, then that the product between gamma w v w squared divided by 2g is wind pressure. Good. Let's see here what is written. I'm, I'm uh, now highlighting with a selection. The max wind forces in the above equation is uh, when phi is 90 degrees, namely the wind blows perpendicular to the ship's center line. And then in these conditions, we simply get that uh, if you look above PW, if we put here 
for phi the value of 90 degree this equation which I am highlighting reduces to this one PW is equal to CW times AW times P where P is precisely wind pressure in kilonewton per square meter and uh, this is a pressure as you can see and it's given by gamma w times v w squared divided by 2g okay now this pressure let's compute it because it's interesting because i want to verify whether it is true that for a wind velocity of 30 meters per second with a gas factor of 1.2 I get a wind pressure which is 0.81 kilonewton per square meter. So let's make this computation. Let's just see whether by applying this relationship with phi equal 90 degree, I get this minimum wind pressure of 0.81 kilonewton per square meter okay remember this should be obtained for a wind velocity of 30 meters per second with a gas factor of 1.2 good now let me check if you have any question if you have any question please let me know on the chat It is not easy. I miss a blackboard. It's not easy to explain without a blackboard, but I think we can manage. Basically, it is quite simple. Now, let's make this computation. So, let me open a. This is an electronic sheet. It's not Excel, it's LibreOffice. It's the free version. Now, what I said is wind velocity should be. 30 meters per second good the gas factor is 1.2 good then uh, let me introduce here the suggested value for gamma w specific gravity of air sorry Okay, I am copying it and then pasting it here. Specific gravity of air. So let me put the value here and I have to put a comma here. This, uh, I think the units are fine. Let me see what is the unit is kilonewton. Kilonewton. Oops, sorry. Kilonewton per cubic meter. Good. Now I can compute the wind pressure. The wind pressure is given by this relationship here. Um, let me take, uh, sorry, what is it here? Yeah, gamma W times uh, wind velocity squared divided by 2G. Okay, so let me put here gravity equal 9,81. And then I can compute the wind pressure equal so it is plus gamma w here times now i have to compute the wind velocity times the gas factor here it is square divided by 2 divided by or let me like this let me do like this divided by 
2 times gravity. Let's hope that it's 0 0.81. Yes, perfect. We got 0 0.81, which is, uh, as I said, the minimum wind velocity that we should consider when designing berths. If I put here the max, uh, which is suggested, I should get 1.5, okay, 1.44, which is the max, the max, sorry, wind pressure that uh, it is suggested to use when I design a berth, okay? We, we did these considerations and you asked some questions uh, in the last uh, lecture. I hope this is clear. If it's not, write on the chat, then I can go back to my web page and I am ready to discuss this graph which gives the wind pressure depending on wind speed. Wind speed is given along the vertical left axis and you have the resulting wind pressure in the horizontal axis. Here you can see that if you take a wind speed of uh, uh, 30 and you should increase it to something like 34 because it's, uh, you have to introduce uh, the gust factor or 30, let me see, and, um, yes, uh, sorry, let's take um, wind speed of 30 and let's see what is the resulting wind pressure. So let's start from the value of 30 in the vertical axis. You have two curves. The first one that you encounter, if you move right from the value of 30, it's uh, the uh, curve that uh, is computed, is the wind pressure that is computed by only considering wind velocity without gust factor. And you see that it's around, uh, you get a wind pressure if you go down about 0.6 kilonewton per square meter. The way the curve is computed, uh, square velocity divided by 1600, here 1600 is just uh, the product of uh, specific gravity of hair, specific weight of hair divided by 2 divided by g divided by 2g. So 1600 is a coefficient that it's derived, as I said. If you keep moving right from the value of 30, you get the second curve. The second curve has the gust factor included. And if you go down from the second curve, you get the pressure of 0.8 more or less which corresponds uh, to what we just computed so these curves just give you the relationship between wind speed and wind pressure in two forms uh, depending on whether or not the gust factor is accounted for good now let's look at again at the caption at the label of the left vertical axis you see that there is the specification that the wind speed it, it's taken at 10 meters above flat terrain with a, a duration of 10 minutes so why this is specified it is specified because we want to make a correspondence between the wind speed in the vertical left axis and the wind classification the Beaufort classification that is reported in the right vertical axis and uh, this correspondence applies uh, if you refer to a wind speed uh, which is taken for an appropriate time and at an appropriate level so this is why there is this specification in the label okay by the way this is red drawn from uh, a reference that I widely used for elaborating this lecture. The reference is given at the bottom of the lecture. 
it's Torresen 2010 this is freely available on the web so if you search on the web for this reference you can find it you don't need to have a look at it I just wanted to tell this to you because actually this reference is much more expanded with respect to my treatment so it may be a useful reference for you in the future if you need to expand what we are discussing okay now here I am also saying that uh, keep in mind that wind can uh, not only induce a translation uh, sorry a translation of the ship but it may also induce a momentum a moment of rotation no sorry a moment of rotation and not a momentum a moment of rotation we will discuss uh, rotation of the ship below okay now let's compute the load because so far uh, we computed the, uh, the wind force wind pressure and wind force and uh, but what is uh, the load which is induced by uh, by the ship by the ship exposed to wind to the moorings this is what i want to discuss now so what is uh, the load that is transmitted by the ship exposed to wind to the berth structure this is what i want to discuss now so we already know that uh, the wind force is given by the product of uh, the considered component of the wind pressure by the area of ship above water appropriately projected okay of course this uh, force depends on the ship geometry and ship condition in particular ballast load keep in mind that uh, if you increase ballast then you reduce the exposure of the boat to wind I am giving here some orders of magnitude again taken by Torresen so a rule of thumb here is that a cargo ship of about 30,000 tons fully loaded may have a wind area of about 15 square meters per each meter of ship length in the longitudinal direction while in ballast condition the area the same area may increase to 20 so there is an increase of about 30 percent of exposed area which means an increase of 30 percent of uh, the wind force and the wind load when the ship is in ballast conditions so when the ship is empty large passenger ships have wind areas of about 35 square meters per linear meter in the longitudinal, longitudinal direction or more now if the wind blows at an angle which is the usual situation of course there will be a transverse and longitudinal load component plus a possible rotational moment which we will discuss later because if you look at the okay yes okay yes uh, we are talking about the windage area in the longitudinal direction which is uh, the area of the side of the boat projected over a plane that is uh, uh, it, it is uh, placed along the longitudinal direction and uh, it's perpendicular to the mean sea level so it's a vertical plane which is displaced along the longitudinal direction and we want to give an estimate of the area of the ship along the longitudinal direction which is projected over this plane so uh, the indication that we give is the windage area per unit length of the ship so what i said these values are 
for instance, 35 square meter of area per unit longitudinal length of the ship. Again, this is the side area of the ship projected over the vertical plane that is placed along the longitudinal direction. Is it clear? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Now, we have to compute the load that is uh, uh, transmitted by the wind, by the wind and the ship over the berth. And the load, the load should be considered along a given direction, which, uh, for instance, we call it, uh, we call here, uh, we call here x. And uh, we are talking now about the distributed load, which means that uh, independently of where moorings are placed, we can express the load as a distributed load or a concentrated load over the moorings. Usually we have to size the moorings by considering the concentrated load, but the overall structure of the berth is to be designed by considering the distributed load. Therefore, if you have a direction X, the distributed load is, uh, can be obtained by simply dividing the overall load, which is uh, PW, the wind force that we previously computed, projected along the direction X, divided by the length of the berth LQ. So if the berth is aligned along a direction X, we have to project the wind force along that direction, the wind force given by equation one above. So we get the component of PW along X. We divide it by the length of the berth and we have the distributed load, okay? We have also to take into account, we assume here, we are assuming that the moorings are able to distribute the load uniformly, which has to be verified actually. It has to be verified by looking at the load that each mooring is getting. And in order to get the load of each mooring, we need to know the displacement of the moorings. And also we need to know if there is a rotational moment. Okay, so let's have a look at this mooring scheme here. First of all, I think it is interesting that you look at the terminology. Usually, a ship, when it's moored, should be moored in a way that doesn't allow any movement of the ship. So we use a series of ropes. As you know, if you look at how, uh, how ships are docking, you see that uh, they fix uh, a series of ropes uh, in order to fully, to fully uh, dock, to fully moor the ship to the berth. And here we see an example with six uh, ropes, six moorings, and uh, the name, the nautical term to identify each rope is described here from one to six. We have an headline, number one, because we need to keep the forward part of the ship, the bow, against the dock. Perfect. Number two is, a for, is called forward breast line, keeps the ship close to the pier, or in particular, it uh, keeps the bow close to the pier, to the berth. Number three is a forward spring, prevents from advancing, moving in a direction which is longitudinal. Then number four is called haft spring, prevents from moving back. Number five, it's haft breast line. Again, it keeps the stern of the ship close to the pier and then there is a stern line which prevents forward movement this is the usual way in which a ship is moored now once we know the wind pressure 
we can estimate a longitudinal component along the birth direction for instance we can call it uh, p w uh, sorry p d x as we did before and then we can estimate an orthogonal component the orthogonal component may be against the birth which translate into a pressure and if it is against the birth the birth usually it is transmitted to the birth through the fenders i hope you know what are the fenders let me show you what they are both fender and here you see a sequence of images look at this one here for instance these are the fenders they may have a different shape and basically they have uh, are in charge of um, avoiding the impact the direct impact of the ship body against the birth and they transmit the pressure to the birth itself fenders here are not visualized if uh, instead the wind is from land to the sea then there is a traction load by the ship over the moorings which tends to pull the birth seaside of course uh, the type of forcing of the ship against the birth depends on the wind direction and once that you know the wind overall forcing you can divide the forcing between among each mooring by making a classical composition of forces in this case is decomposition according to the principle of structural mechanics that you know better than me and physics so you have to decompose the wind force along uh, in uh, along the directions of these uh, of these ropes uh, which connect uh, the ship to the birth and uh, it is an exercise of physics uh, forcing the composition in this way you get the individual forcing over the moorings uh, and uh, also you get uh, uh, you get uh, you can get an estimate of the distributed load but actually in order to make this decomposition you also need to know the rotational moment because uh, you know the wind is acting against the ship and uh, the ship may rotate for the effect of the wind and uh, if there is a rotation for instance the bow may get closer to the berth and the stern may tend to get uh, far from the birth which means that uh, there are there is um, a different distribution of the loads over the moorings so you may have pressure in correspondence of uh, of the bow against the berth and you may have attraction in correspondence of the stern for the effect of wind if there is rotation because uh, you know uh, the, if uh, the ship was uh, not allowed to rotate then the composition of course would be simpler but in this case you also have to take into account the rotation okay and now we are talking about rotation in general the action of wind generates as i just said wind drift and rotational moment and in order to understand uh, rotation we have to discuss how um, a window, uh, sorry, a ship rotates. And when is rotation originated? When the center of gravity of the windage area does not coincide with the pivot point. What is the pivot point? Okay. It is defined here. We need to define the pivot point it is the point around which the ship appears to be turning for an observer standing on board 
So let's suppose that a ship rotate and you are standing on board. So you may feel that you are just rotating around which means that you are in correspondence of the pivot point or you may feel that you are rotating and and uh, translating which means that you are not over the pivot point so if you are standing over the pivot point after rotation you get the feeling that you are just rotating but remaining fixed over the same point how can we identify the pivot point for a resting vessel the pivot point coincides with the center of gravity of the underwater body of the ship so you get the center of gravity of the underwater body and this is precisely the pivot point but the pivot point when the vessel when the ship moves moves as well in particular when the vessel moves forward the position of the pivot point shifts forward and for typical velocities there is a rule of thumb that says that the pivot point for a vessel moving forward will move to about one fourth of the length of the vessel from the bow from the forward so it advances okay and when the vessel moves astern the position of the pivot point in a similar way shifts astern and it may take as a rule of thumb the position in correspondence of one fourth of the length of the vessel from the stern so rotation as i said is originated when the center of gravity of the windage area does not coincide with the pivot point so if you know the center of gravity of the windage area which is typically the area above water and you know the center of gravity of uh, the underwater body of the ship you can estimate the moment of rotation because uh, you can see whether the wind force is aligned with the pivot point and therefore you don't have any rotation conversely as it often happens if you have uh, the center of gravity of the windage area that is uh, not aligned with the center of gravity of the underwater body of the ship you have also a rotation so the besides the wind drift which is which tends to move the ship along the wind direction besides the wind drift you have the rotation of the vessel and when the vessel is moved of course this matters a lot it also matters because a vessel rotating if it is allowed to rotate then there is a change of the angle phi which is the angle between the wind direction and the ship center line and therefore you have a change of the wind force because you have a change in the computation of the wind force if you look at the equation one with the change of phi you have a change of wind force and this is a dynamic evolution so if the ship is not moored it's not our case but if the ship is not moored then rotation continuously changes the overall the total wind force over the ship and in particular you know that uh, if the ship is allowed to rotate it will rotate in a way to minimize the area exposed to wind if it is moored of course uh, there is no rotation so you don't have this problem of dynamic evolution but you have to consider the moment of rotation when you compute the loads over the mooring we are not going into details i just want to give you an overview an overview of what are uh, the actions and uh, the dynamic evolutions that you have to consider when you compute the load on each mooring and the distributed load over the berth and that's it this figure is just for for embellishing the web page do you have any question about this before we turn into wave forces
okay very good so so far we considered i remember i just want to to remind you that we are considering environmental forcing we considered the environmental forcing over the births we considered the, the wind forces and now we are considering wave forces wave forces that may be may be, may act directly over the birth and and may act over the ship and therefore generate load through the ship over the birth again my my discussion here will be uh, will be quite brief if you want to expand then you may reference you may refer to torsen the reference that i just indicated to you so wave forces uh, first of all we need to um, to characterize uh, the waves so we have to define wave behaviors uh, in proximity of ports and uh, waves in the proximity of ports uh, have different behaviors with respect to offshore you are already familiar with the uh, estimation of wave height for uh, offshore conditions you know that we need uh, we need uh, uh, observations of wave height one possibility is to collect observation of uh, the max wave height that is observed in the annual period and if we get a series that is long enough uh, you remember that through the gamble distribution you may get uh, a reliable estimate of wave forcing uh, offshore there is to say that waves in the proximity of ports have different behaviors and the different behaviors because uh, while uh, waves offshore are uh, generated by wind uh, with little interaction with uh, the seabed in the proximity of ports you have an interaction with the seabed you have uh, these uh, effect of wave transformations wave transformation known as uh, refraction diffraction and reflection and also you have uh, the effect of breaking which is extremely important also uh, there is to say that inside ports uh, wave are uh, mitigated because ports are usually sheltered in order to offer a relatively calm conditions for the moored for the docked ships and therefore uh, defining the behaviors of waves uh, within ports uh, may require may require uh, getting local observations indeed it is quite easy to get observations of uh, wave height inside ports and uh, but in some cases uh, it may be necessary to to set up new instrumental recordings and uh, if this is the case because for instance you are building a new port when you are building a new port uh, you may you may not have any information about waves uh, in the considered location if you are renewing a port usually you have also you have already observations but if you are designing a new port you may completely lack observations in this case it is suggested that uh, if you need any instrumental recording this is started as soon as possible it's the first thing that one should do because uh, given that uh, waves uh, we already discussed this are um, a random process it is uh, they need to be defined in an inductive way a wave so sorry in an inductive way so we have to use inductive methods which means that we have to define their behavior by looking at observations and uh, what is the ideal length of the observation period to get a sufficiently detailed uh, description of waves? Uh, usually we say that it's uh, a period of five years, which is deemed to be sufficient, long enough for getting a um, good definition for port uh, and harbor design. 
It is important to have uh, clear what is wave breaking because uh, you know that uh, waves uh, are, um, are a transfer of energy rather than a transfer of mass. But after breaking, they turn into a transfer, transfer of mass. So breaking is extremely important because, uh, because uh, the transfer of mass is uh, more, uh, more concerning than the transfer of energy. The transfer of energy is just an up and down of water, which generates ups and downs uh, in the body of the ship. When there is, uh, when the wave after breaking turns into a transfer of mass, then you have a physical impact of the wave against the ship in terms of um, mass that is moving uh, with a velocity that may be significant, and therefore the type of impact is significantly different. Uh, here I propose to you a formula for uh, breaker height so when uh, when uh, when the wave height is uh, such that this relationship applies where wave height is hb and uh, c depth is db when this relationship applies then uh, waves are likely to break this is just an empirical relationship you have other relationships that you studied with professor Arketti, so you can consider whatever relation you 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 want it it's uh, it's uh, i mean it is uh, appropriate to make sure that inside the port waves don't break because uh, to avoid uh, the more concerning impact uh, due to the transfer of mass and therefore this gives to you a rule of thumb to compute uh, to compute uh, what is uh, a minimum depth that is required to for the port in order to avoid uh, breaking so um, now let's take into account what are the behaviors of the port which have an influence on waves inside the port and uh, and then let's discuss uh, what is the ideal return period which we should use for determining the design wave height and after designing the wave height, uh, we can get an idea of the wave forcing. So actually, uh, the characteristic of the waves uh, depends on the bathymetry. We already discussed it in the vicinity of the birth. Also, we have to take into account reflection, uh, refraction, and also shoaling. Shoaling because uh, it's due, as you know, to the interaction of waves with the seabed which causes the wave height to increase and uh, eventually it may it may cause wave breaking and uh, and also the wave regime in the arbor area due to uh, swells uh, or wind generated waves so we have to also consider the wave regime of course offshore in the arbor area which interacts with the local behaviors to generate the wave regime into the, the port. I put a box here, which is not really relevant for our conditions, which is explaining um, an effect which is, uh, I think it's interesting that you know, that may lead to the formation of rogue waves. Rogue waves are also called monster waves and uh, they are they don't occur in proximity of ports because ports as i said are usually sheltered against extreme waves but it may happen in the open ocean that suddenly an unusually large wave may unexpectedly develop 
and this is you due to probably due because um, the processes that lead to the formation of these monsters are not completely known they are probably due to the nonlinear interaction nonlinear superimposition of uh, several wave trains because you know when uh, you are in the middle of a storm actually you have uh, several trains of waves interacting and uh, it's not just a plane wave that is moving like uh, when you look at swells in open ocean usually they can be well approximated by a scheme of a plane wave but uh, when you are in the midst of a storm then you have several waves that are interacting superimposing and their non-linear interaction can originate occasionally a single wave that is extremely high and uh, they can be extremely dangerous even to large ships they are unpredictable because their mechanism of formation is poorly known and uh, in the past they were thought to exist only in legend because they could not be explained by any mathematical model and uh, people who saw them probably didn't survive today they are known to occur in a few cases were monitored the first one was monitored in and measured in 1995 so this is a quite recent phenomena i think it's interesting to read uh, this uh, panel uh, here which is explaining what we know about these waves there is also a wikipedia page which i suggest you to visit again this is not relevant for ports but i wanted to mention this uh, effect to you because it's a clear demonstration that uh, we are still far from being able to predict to fully predict uh, the behaviors of waves uh, they are a random process that can be um, it's they are very difficult to predict okay now it is interesting to discuss uh, about the design wave that we have to adopt into a port and uh, I would like to make a, a consideration on the return period you already know these concepts you already know how to estimate the design wave for a given return period but I want to make sure that you handle that you manage these concepts in a very firm way I, I want to make sure that you well know what is return period what is probability etc what is the return period for in, an engineer it's quite uh, it's quite um, easy to explain it is a definition that is um, is understandable very understandable the return period let me use the same wording here is defined as the average time lapse between two consecutive events with wave height reaching or exceeding a given threshold okay which means that you observe waves you observe wave height and uh, you fix a threshold like uh, a value of the wave you are interested in and you observe the frequency of waves that reach or or uh, pass this threshold and then you estimate the average time lapse between two consecutive events and keep in mind average because if I say that a given wave height has a return period of 10 years, it means that uh, this is the average interval between two events leading to wave height that is equal or above the threshold. It means that if I observe such a wave height tomorrow, it doesn't mean that for 10 years I will not see any other event like that i may see another event after one day even if the return period is 10 years because 10 years is an average 
So to give you an example to refer to river flooding, which I know probably better than arbor engineering, if you look at the Po River, we got a 50-year flood, which means a flood with 50 years retro period in 51, 1951. And then we got another one in 1994 after 43 years, which is comparable to 50, so okay. And then we got another one in 2000 after only six years. Because it's the average interval that is 50 years, not the single one. Keep in mind this, this is extremely important. Usually we select a design return period for designing birth, for designing any marine structure. We select a design return period against wave forcing, which means that we select a design return period for wave height. So the usual, the usual statement is I want to design a given structure against a given return period. What does this mean? It means that uh, if I design a berth against a wave height with 50 year return period, this will be oversized, over, over designed with respect to a birth that is designed against a 10 year return period. Of course, if I want a structure to resist against something that happens on average every 50 years, this structure will be more resistant than another one that is designed against an event that is on average occurs every 10 years. And uh, the reason is that extreme events are unfrequent. So if I design against uh, an extreme event, I am designing against an unfrequent event. So increasing the return period of an event increases the extreme character of the event. Okay, so what is the return period that I should select? Well, uh, there are in some locations, in some nations, there are law in force, there are regulations that suggest uh, what is the design return period. So the first thing you have to look at is regulations laws in force. If there are no regulations, then you may refer to standards, guidelines, which may be international. There are, for instance, some rules suggested by, by ISO or uh, UNI, which, uh, which uh, may refer to, may be referred to. Remember, regulations, you are strictly obliged to meet them. When you refer to standards and guidelines, these are not to be strictly respected. It's a different story. So this is why you have to first look at regulations and then to international standards. Keep in mind that uh, regulations are those uh, to which uh, a judge, a court, look, looks at if they have to, to, if they have to express their opinion against a court case, because this happens sometimes. We design structures, structures fail, and then there is a court case which aims to inspect the responsibility of the designer. And therefore, the first thing that the court uh, may, uh, does is to look at uh, whether or not the engineer, the designer, respected the regulations. And then they also look at the international standards because, uh, as I said, it's advisable that we meet them. Now, lifetime, uh, sorry, the return period 
is also selected by looking at the consequences of a failure. If the consequences of a failure are only an economic damage, usually the retour period is lower with respect to the situation when a failure implies a risk for the human life. For instance, uh, if you look at dams, dams are usually designed with uh, against an event with a retour period of 500 years. In general, when human life is at risk, the retour period is not lower than 100 years. If you design a bridge in road construction for an important road, the suggested retour period is 200 years. If the road is a um, less important one, then you may go down to 100 years, depending on the local regulation, of course, that you have always to consult. So, also, one usually looks at the expected lifetime of the structure because uh, it is a rule of thumb that uh, if you design a structure for a lifetime of 50 years then a rule of thumb is that the return period the design return period is at least of the same length of the lifetime this is a rule of thumb because actually it doesn't always apply. There are some, uh, some structures that don't uh, imply any relevant uh, impact if they fail, and therefore they are designed against a low retro period, uh, which may be much lower than the lifetime. But as a rule of thumb, you may also consider the order of magnitude of the lifetime. Now, you don't have uh, to, um, to incur in a frequent misconception. It is uh, frequently uh, assumed that uh, uh, if you have a lifetime of 50 years and uh, you design the structure against a retro period of 50 years, it is frequently assumed that uh, we have uh, almost 100% probability to get the design event during the lifetime. I try to better explain. If we, again, if we adopt a design retour period of 50 years, many people think that in the course of 50 years, it's almost certain that I get this event. This is wrong, absolutely. It doesn't mean that uh, if I have a retro period of 10 years, it doesn't mean that uh, within 10 years, the event will occur with certainty. It is the same reasoning that I made before. The retro period is an average time. It's interesting to develop an example. And the example brings us to discuss what will be the next figure that is included in my web page. So the example is, what is uh, the probability of uh, getting uh, an event which has a given retro period during a given period of time? So if I have uh, an event with uh, a retro period of 50 years, what is the probability of getting this event in the course of 50 years or in the course of 100 years or in the course of 10 years. This is a classical exercise of probability. Again, if I have a design, if I design a berth for a, retro, for a wave height, which occurs with a retro period of 50 years, what is the probability in 50 years that I get such a wave height? This is interesting because it avoids a misconception. As I said, some people think that uh, during uh, a lifetime that is equivalent to the retro period, we for sure will get that wave height, which is wrong. Okay, so let's look at how this probability is computed according to the laws of probability. Now, I assume that you know what is uh, probability of not exceedance which uh, may be expressed in percentage. If I say that a given wave height, 
as a probability of not exceedance of 10% in, uh, in a year, for instance, it means uh, it has a precise meaning. It means that in a given year, I have 90% probability that the wave height is not exceeded. Okay. And uh, let's, uh, let's uh, refer to this probability with the symbol capital P. Sorry. I am selecting it on the web page. You see it here, capital P. And let's assume that we indeed refer to uh, the yearly maximum wave height. So we express with P the probability of not exceedance of the yearly max wave height. Here there is a spelling error. Let me take a note because I need to correct it. Just one second. Maximum. Okay. Okay, very good. Now now uh, let me just start with the, the relationship between probability of not exceedance and return period for the max annual wave height which can be expressed as you see here p i cannot select it it's an image but here it is p is equal to t minus 1 divided by t this relationship please note only applies to the case of one value per year and the return period is expressed here in years so only applies this example to the case where our observation our observations are one per year in this case it's the max wave height per year so here if you take a return period of 10 you get that probability is equal to 0.9 which means 90 percent so if i get a wave height with a return period of 10 years the probability of not exceeding that wave height in a given year is 90 percent okay which means that i have only 10 percent of probability in a given year to exceed that wave height okay so keep in mind this relationship which allows us for the annual maxima series of a given process to relate probability of not exceedance with the return period very good now let's go back so what is the joint probability that the given wave height is not exceeded in n years again what i get from this relationship here it's the probability that in one single year a given wave height is not exceeded but what if i consider a sequence of years of course the probability will uh, of not exceedance will decrease because it's not just a single year that i'm considering i am considering a sequence of n years let me look at the chat i see that you don't have any any questions so i am moving forward so if i am considering any years then the probability and here there is a sorry i go back i am missing i think i should have included here um, a subscript to p i should have called it pn just to make a difference between the probability which refers to only one year and the probability which refers to more than 
one year, I will change it. But again, the probability to exceed a given, not to exceed a given wave height in a sequence of n years is given by this relationship. This is the law of joint probability. And this is what I am interested in. So what is the probability, for instance, in 10 years to get a wave height not exceeding a the value which corresponds to a return period of 50 years. You can compute it through this relationship. But let's compute it just to make uh, another interesting exercise. So let's suppose I go to the Excel sheet. Let's suppose that the return period, return period is varying. So let's start from 50 years and then Let's uh, take um, n duration of 10 years. So what is the probability that in 10 years uh, I get uh, a wave height not exceeding the value which corresponds to re the retro period of 50 years? Okay, so probability and let me put not exceeding so uh, let me call it p and a give me one second i need to reply to a call because you know in this situation i can't discard any call just one second Ma dunque io so che alcuni entrano per fare lezione e so che entra il professor Mesini che però va al secondo piano e poi so che eh, nel laboratorio Labic sono al lavoro, come lei sa, la Boi e Paglianti. Poi, poi temo anche, però non ne sono sicuro che ci vada, che potrebbe andarci anche la professoressa Bignozzi, ma non ne sono sicuro. Poi potrebbe essere che qualche amministrativo entra sporadicamente. Dunque io in realtà le autorizzazioni ce le ho tutte, però sinceramente andare a controllarle perché ne avrò concesso una ventina, con, ognuna con date multiple, andarle a controllare mi, mi crea un problema. Però quello che io posso fare è mandare un messaggio a tutto il Dipartimento. Quindi in, in buona sostanza se lei mi dice eh, che eh, l'edificio non deve essere, eh, nessuno deve avere accesso, non deve essere acceduto in, una, in un determinato periodo, io lo comunico e poi quello che possiamo fare è disabilitare i badge, se si può. Ecco. Sì, però guardi meglio se quello va benissimo perché in questo modo se c'è qualcuno dentro lo, chiaramente va fuori, eh, però se io lo so prima è meglio perché io mi, così poi disabilitiamo i badge, una volta che sono disabilitati li disabilitiamo, sì, certo, bisogna stare attenti che non ci sia qualcuno dentro, se lo so prima se me lo fa sapere, secondo me guardi la, le, tre, le tre cose, email più disabilitazione più altoparlante, dopo siamo a posto, quanto durerà secondo lei? Va bene, va benissimo, grazie a lei, grazie a lei, buongiorno.
here I am students so as I said let's compute the probability that a given wave height with a return period of 50 years is not exceeded in 10 years and uh, what we have to do is uh, just write oops sorry just write here plus two parentheses we have to make return period minus one close the parentheses divided by the return period itself I close the other parentheses to the power of 10 and this is the result so this is the probability that a given wave height of uh, return period 50 years it's not exceeded in 10 years let me now compute what is the individual probability for a single year that uh, the given wave height is not exceeded and this is just plus sorry t minus 1 divided by t no sorry this is a mistake divided by c9 again okay good so you see that the probability for a single year is 0.98 which should be the same probability that I get if I put one here perfect for two years it goes down this is not exceedance it goes down to 0.96 three years 0.94 keep in mind if the probability of not exceedance goes down it means that the probability of exceedance increases and the probability of exceedance we can compute it here let me put it here is just plus 1 minus this so it's 0.02 the probability of exceedance for three years it goes up to 0.05 let me put it in percentage because it's uh, it's uh, more clear 2% okay it goes up to 5% in uh, and let me maybe decrease the decimal point it's uh, the number of digits and it's, 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 it's number okay zero okay I put zero digits which which means that I am and this is probability of exceedance now an interesting question what if n is 50 so what if I consider a number of years which is equivalent to the return period okay good I get a probability of exceedance of 64% which means that during a time span of uh, which is equivalent to the return period your probability of getting that wave height is is 64% okay let me go back to the web page which is here just one second here good of course from this relationship here if you want you can uh, take an explicit representation an explicit relationship for t which you can obtain here t depending on probability very good now this figure here and then we make the break is depicting the relationship between the return period of a given wave height lifetime in the 
horizontal axis so n in our case in the, in the case of the previous computation lifetime was indicated with n return period along the vertical axis and then there is the probability of exceedance which is here in the blue lines so our previous computation i get a return period of 50 years and i start from the vertical axis then so let me do like this in order to be more understandable i am drawing over the image so this is my image now let me take a red line A red line from the return period of uh, 50 years, which is here, and then I go to the duration of 50 years, here I am, and I see that I am precisely lying over the probability of exceedance of 63%. I computed 64 before, so that's perfect. So again, and then we make the break. The concept is, if you adopt a design wave height with a, for a given return period, the probability of getting that wave height during a time span, which is equivalent to the return period, is 63%, not 1%. So you are not sure of getting that event during the return period. Now I give you one minute for asking questions, if any, and then we can make the break. Please. I'm happy to know that everything is clear and uh, you know it is to explain in uh, these concepts are not difficult but they are not easy at the same time so to explain them in uh, in this um, in this context in this virtual context is not easy okay so let's make a, let's make a 15 minutes break thank you very much